The Doer is an episode that I've made my opinions on very clear in the past, and I understand that a lot of people still hold this one in high regard. Emotions may be running high then in this YouTube video about a single episode of a fantasy show that aired five years ago, so all I ask is that you withhold your judgement on this video until the very end of this sentence. Oh. Well, go on then, do the thing with the music. Da 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 <laughs> Sansa is making one of these things when the postman arrives with a letter. -na 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 -na. Postman time, it's me, the postman. Do you like knives? What? Do you like knives? I'm sorry, you're not the usual postman, are you? I said, do you like knives? I'm in danger. Now that it's just you and me. I can break character. Hi, I'm noted knife salesman Glinges, and I'm here to tell you about Kamikoto knives. The headline is that Kamikoto takes centuries old Japanese knife making techniques and puts them into your kitchen. I mean, only if you want them to. They won't put knives in your kitchen if you don't want them to. Kamikoto knives are made out of steel sourced only from Japanese mills in places that you already know I can't pronounce. After a rigorous crafting process from expert bladesmiths, each knife is individually inspected and Kamikoto is so confident in the results that every knife comes with a lifetime guarantee. But don't take my word for it. Take the word of these Michelin star chefs. I personally enjoy how sharp they are, but I don't know too much about kitchen knives, more of a stabby knife sort of guy myself. However, I do know my stuff when it comes to nice wooden boxes. And let me tell you, Kamikoto knives come in nice wooden boxes. Keep them in there, take them out, put them back in, You've got options. Big knife, small knife, knife family, knife holes. What's that, you insatiable viewer, you? You want savings? Yeah, we can do savings. Just use the code Glidus at checkout and save $50 on your order on top of the current ongoing sale, which includes free shipping. Honestly, the presentation of these knives is just stellar. They'd make a fantastic gift, but not for me because I already have them. As I was saying, Sansa is making one of these things when the letter carrier arrives with a letter from Uncle Petey. He's in Molestown because he couldn't think of a stupider place to have a meeting than inside a dilapidated brothel. What an insane place to be, not to mention impossible. I feel that it's kind of cheap how they left out any explanation for how Peter even obtained the jetpack in the first place. I know this show often leaves room for the viewer to figure some stuff out, but this is a huge dynamic change to leave open like that, and asking the audience to fill that gap is just too much. Peter arrived at Runestone not too long into the previous episode, at the far side of the Vale, and now he's at Molestown. Fucking Molestown. Which is basically at the Walrus. I understand that the writers wanted the meeting to take place in secret, but the story here is that Peter slipped away from his army, we'll get to the army, don't worry, and crossed the largest of the Seven Kingdoms completely undetected just to chat with Sansa. And he didn't seem to have a problem with Brienne tagging along, so I guess secrecy wasn't all that important to Peter? In that case, why not forgo the ruined brothel and just come to Castle Black if you've already gone to the trouble of coming to the wall? Peter is already aware that Jon is in charge of the campaign. Your brother's army. So why is he just petitioning Sansa knowing what he put her through? Surely Jon would be far more receptive to Peter's assistance because of course he doesn't know yet that Peter sent the pink letter. Not only would it be more sensible plot-wise, but the character interaction of the ever-honourable, duty-bound, principled Jon Snow that they've kept around for some reason, trying to navigate an alliance with the self-serving, manipulative, duplicitous Littlefinger is so juicy. And the opportunity is right there, but again, the writers completely avoid Peter interacting with anything that isn't entirely Sansa-centric. He's not a character unto himself, he's a device for Sansa's story specifically to advance. So teleporting is a classic complaint with this era of the show and it's been done to death. It's a fun thing to talk about but like it's not that big an issue because most viewers who aren't desperate nerds are perfectly willing to accept that more time has passed between these scenes and many simply don't care that these locations are so far apart. Most people probably don't even know. But let me point out why this example in particular is so egregious. Prior to the last episode we hadn't seen Peter since episode 7 of season 5 when he left King's Landing. That's six entire episodes he was MIA. Main character, sixth on the bill in that episode, gone for five and a half hours of screen time. After all that, he appears at Runestone. Half a season from King's Landing 
to the Vale. Then, not one entire episode later, he's half a continent away with no audience coaxing betwixt. Here's an extremely simple way this could have been altered to be less jarring and more believable. That scene in episode 4? Put it in episode 3. There you go, job's done. Swap it with the Arya scene or something. I don't see how this could compromise anything else, it leaves more time for Peter to believably make it to Mal's tone, and I would also argue that putting Arya's unblinding and her attending the bloody hand closer together is favourable too. Maybe even put an itty bitty travel scene where Peter arrives at Moat Caitlin in episode 4. I don't know. I guess nobody in the writing room cared much about this. And I get it, it's important to a lot of us, but it isn't to them. But it is a thing, and it does make the world feel smaller. And it's a letdown, considering the torture Gurm put himself through in untying the Miranese knot and stuff like that. There's a version of this story that is committed to a consistent world, and a version that is no longer concerned with that at all. Anyway, I like that Peter remembers Brienne, and I like that Sansa brought her in the first place. No clue where Podrick is though. I'm just a Podrick fan and want to see more of him, so this isn't much of a criticism, but I am forced to wonder what he was doing when Brienne naffed off to Molestown. Tiddlywinks with Ed, maybe. And now I guess I'll talk about the fucking plot of the scene, which has a lot of heavy lifting to do. Namely, digging Peter out of the hole that season 5 wrote him into. Sansa is, of course, completely correct when she says, Did you know about Ramsay? If you didn't know, you're an idiot. If you did know, you're my enemy. So, okay, let's dig into that. We later learn that Peter wants Sansa for his queen. A picture of me on the Iron Throne and you by my side. Stop doing that! So clearly he didn't want her married to Ramsay long term, and his grief in this scene feels like it's supposed to be genuine, so the enemy thing is right out, which leaves the idiot thing. And here's the problem. This character, the one on screen currently, his name is Peter Baelish, and you may know him from another show, Game of Thrones, which was the predecessor of the Dragon Show. In Game of Thrones, this Peter Baelish fellow is incredibly clever. Even Funny Dwarf thinks so. He's politically savvy like no one else, he frequently exhibits a genius ability to improvise positive outcomes from unfavourable conditions, and though his motivations were somewhat mysterious, he's always shown to be focused and ambitious. Absolute Sigma Grindset performance. Then he gave Sansa to the Boltons to, uh, um, sloppily copy a plot from the fifth book. See, when Sansa questions him on it in this scene, he just says that he made a mistake, which means he was wrong about what he thought would happen. Okay, so what did he think would happen? After Peter gives Sansa to Roos, they speak of alliances. Even though Roos's position is practically worthless to Peter, and it's far more sensible to hold on to Sansa until Stannis takes Winterfell, which Peter thinks he will do. He has a larger army. He's the finest military commander in Westeros. A betting man would put his money on Stannis. In season 5, Peter speaks of ambitious gambles, then says that he'd bet on Stannis, and yet he gives Sansa away to the Boltons. Anyway, he strikes a deal with Cersei, where he's supposed to take Winterfell from the victor of the Battle of Ice, and she makes him Warden of the North. Which I guess makes sense if you're a moron. You know, give Sansa to Roost to make him more of a threat so that the Crown rewards you for defeating him, even though you think Stannis will do that anyway. But then, he goes ahead and tells Elena about Cersei's affair with Lancel so that she she can get the faith to imprison Cersei, ruin her reputation, and strip her of her power, thus rendering his deal with her completely pointless. To sum up, Peter thinks Stannis will take Winterfell, so he makes an alliance with Roose Bolton and gives him his most valuable asset, the Key to the North. Then he makes a deal with Cersei to undermine Roose's power. Then he makes a deal with Olenna to undermine Cersei's power. You know the heist episode of Rick and Morty where characters keep making deals and backstabbing one another completely at random? Yeah, that's Peter in season 5. I made a mistake. Yeah, you did, buddy. Yeah, you did. I underestimated a stranger. This is the other pillow on the bed of bollocks atop which this scene lays. Everyone is your enemy. I've heard very little about you. Everyone is your friend. Which makes you quite a rare thing. I didn't know. Every possible series of events is happening all at once. I made a mistake. Live that way and nothing will surprise you. A horrible mistake. Everything that happens will be something that you've seen before. I underestimated a stranger. Everyone is your enemy. I underestimated a stranger. And nothing will surprise you. I didn't know. Every possible series of events is happening 
all at once. I'm a bit confused. You're an idiot. I think this point makes itself. I'm not sure whether to categorize this as an issue with season five, season six, or season seven, so let's just zoom back into the scene at hand and say that it completely fails to address pre-existing issues and if anything steers harder into them. Like, we needed an explanation for Peter's insane behavior, right? Or else it makes no sense and the character is no longer the character and it sucks. <laughs> But what we get is him basically just admitting that it's a plot hole. Uh, what else? Right, Brienne doesn't say shit, Peter never appeals to her, and you know, it's a little weird that Sansa even met with Peter in the first place. Like, she was down to do it as soon as she got the letter from the postman. No, gotta be careful saying that word now. Apparently. I'm saying it would have been neat if we had a little scene where she mulled it over with Brienne, or even John. That could be interesting. Oh, and at the end, Peter says that Grunkle Brynden has rallied the remainder of the Tully forces and retaken River Run from the Frey Lannister Alliance? I beg your fucking pardon? Did he use Ramsay's 20 good men? Yeah, this comes straight up out of nowhere as a vehicle to drive Brienne to River Run for the Jamie scene they want later towards the end of the season. So back in season three, or maybe even season four, they could have told us that River Run was holding out under siege, but they either forgot or decided not to. So now they just pull this bullshit out of the plot hat. The remaining Tully forces. You know, the six guys that managed to run away from the Red Wedding. <laughs> Get fucked. I must say that emotionally, the scene has some power to it, even just conceptually, but yeah, it's got plot holes large enough to pilot an aircraft carrier through. Not that you would. Oh shit, and we didn't even get into Sansa denying the offer of an entire fresh army, what you'd think is the strongest force on the continent. Look, I guess she doesn't quite grasp how unfavorable their situation is, but still, awakened Sansa should know better than to deny this. She should definitely know better than to keep it from Jon. Oh fuck, the army! At Moat Kaelin! You know, the chokehold of the north? Yeah, the entire army is just hanging out there while Peter quickly dipped out to cross a kingdom for a cheeky catch-up. I mean, this is fine so long as Ramsay, you know, reacts to it in any way at all. Unless we're supposed to assume that the Knights of the Vale are, in addition to being the most hyped army, are also fucking invisible. Okay, so that's that scene. It's, uh, it's not great. Idiot. But surely the episode can come back from this, right? I mean, this is the doer, right? Oh god. The House of Boar and Snore continues to blow me away with its stunning cast of interesting characters. I'm gonna hold off on broad analyses until no one, so let's just tackle this scene as is. You'll never be one of us, Lady Stark. Fuck you, I'm so tired of you, just go away. Oh, she actually did, huh. This one has another test of Arya's commitment. And now a girl is one of them, if a girl desires. Huh? And it's just so weird that in episode 3, Jacken decided to unblind her after she committed to the cult and asked who they wanted her to kill, and now in this episode he's still talking to her about committing to the cult and she's still asking about who they wanted to kill. So what's the fucking point of this scene at all? Jacken gives Arya a history lesson, which Grant Scheme doesn't do much except either confuse the audience or raise a bunch of questions for them that, as of show's end, are still raised. Poor things. Terrible fate for a question to be raised and left like that for so long. So there's an extra featurette from the season 5 Blu-ray about the many-faced god which is actually pretty cool. It's all about how this weird cult syncretizes aspects of death from all these different religions and how death is a pivotal and unavoidable part of the human experience unless you're John in which case it's a minor inconvenience. Like it makes the world feel bigger by going through all these religions but also more connected by integrating them into one belief system. So there's none of that here which isn't a problem itself, I, I did just just call it an extra, so a missed opportunity at worst. But the problem is that rather than talking about this cool syncretic nature of the cult, or explaining how the face shit works, or delving into the philosophy of the relationship between identity and death or some big brain shit like that, Jacken decides to instead tell us that Bravos was founded by faceless men. Good to know, man. But uh, it's kind of difficult to picture a society where everyone's an assassin with no identity, so unless this is just some really stupid and un uncharacteristically subtle social commentary, the faceless men specifically having founded Bravos instead of escaped slaves generically is dumb. Also, the whole conversation is predicated on the waif saying Arya doesn't belong and Jack and kind of agreeing because of Arya's place in the Westerosi class structure. None of the first faceless men were born to lords and ladies. Which completely baffles me. Enthly, why would you seek her out if that was the case, you gormless character cavity? And N plus 
monthly, why does that even matter if the entire point of this stupid fucking cult is that anyone and everyone is and isn't no one? She has a point. No, she doesn't, and she's clearly exhibiting personal emotions about Aya, and you're ignoring it even though she's supposed to be no one. Do you see what happens when you think about this plot at all? It gets better. Like, fuck does it get better. This play scene is so much fun. I love you, father. Please don't die. Shut Ooh. up, you swine. I might have a personal soft spot for characters experiencing different interpretations of things they lived through, but trying to put my own emotions aside, it's just such a nice break of tone in this plot. Having Arya see Crane's portrayal of Cersei as a tragic figure, Clorenzo's virtuous Joffrey, and Camello's crass moronic Ned is great. Getting to see the city of Bravos alive for once is great. The Renaissance theatre vibe is great. The tidbits to sell that this is a genuine production are great. And of course, when it comes to devouring scenery, Richard E. Grant is unparalleled. Oh! Murdered by a boar! The great big hairy whore! Such a small role, yet so perfectly cast. Oh, is it Riesling? Good for you. Look at these sexy Mexican avocados. So yeah, this is the episode's best scene, spoilers. I don't particularly enjoy looking at this guy's diseased clunge plunger, but anything to tip the show's nudity gender imbalance will do, I guess. Everything else is fire. Seeing her reaction to the bloody hand, we actually get to hang out with Arya Stark, not a girl, not epic emotionally devoid ninja assassin girl boss, but Arya Stark. She doesn't even need to say anything. Oh how I wish there were more of this. But wait, there is more! Yeah, there's a deleted scene with some cut bits of the play and they're good too. Lord of the Seven Kingdoms and Protector of the Wine! wine. But there's also a little through line with these two white women expressing disgust at the profanity, violence and nudity on display and Arya tells them to fuck off Basically. Why don't you just leave then? Now, I don't mind a meta joke here or there, if you couldn't fucking tell. But I'm glad this was cut, because hand-waving legitimate criticism with a self-insert epic own like this is pretty cringe. They left the one from the next episode in though, which is weird. Anyway, Isambaro is completely right, Bianca's performance was hollow and stilted. Two lines, Bianca. Two lines, come on. The backstage environment of everyone either mocking or fucking each other is very realistic, so props for that. Aya spots her murder weapon because Crane more or less points a red arrow at it and fucks off without washing her fake dad's smelly gown. Jack and his making a season 5 callback when Arya returns, and he tells her she can't use a face because his meandering has a line, you know. So they sent Arya to kill Lady Crane because they wanted to test her lack of identity or whatever, you know, what with showing her a provocative retelling of her family's tragedies, and Lady Crane being a good person apparently because she acted good and flirted with a dwarf. Presumably they're fishing for a reaction from Arya, and if they don't get one then they can be confident that she's ready to be episode 8, do you get it? They've been testing her skill, now they're they're testing her will, and once she does this she'll be truly ready to become one of the guys and learn how to do the thing. On paper, yeah, it works. Boy, I can't wait to see the completely logical and non-farcical follow-up to this setup, yes I'm deflecting because I don't actually mind Aya's plot in this one episode and may have been too harsh in the Glidus movie, how did you notice? Look, it suffers from weirdly repeating beats from episode 3, but yeah, it's K. This isn't K. Grunkle Maxi has taken Brano to have a geese at some ancient revolution revelatory history. The fella knows this is his last episode so he needs to work the dramatic exposition in as soon as he can. Seriously, it's been well over a year since Bran showed up here with the purpose of learning how to win the coming war, and this most pivotal of information has been withheld from him until right this moment. We've been through it before, this whole plot and everything the Three-Eyed Raven does has no genuine motivation, it's all just exposition spoon fed in the correct order to keep the viewer artificially intrigued. Why were we at Winterfell? Oop, better keep watching. What's in that tower? No, 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 not so soon. What's the significance of the children of the forest having created the White Walkers? No, this one actually does go nowhere. Hey look, it's the Arrowhead Mountain, what a coinky dink. On its own, the scene is suitably ominous and captivating too because of the implications that go woefully unexplored concerning the nature of the White Walkers and how Leaf is like at least 30 years old if this guy is actually Rhaegar. But yeah, what we learn here is basically the extent of it. And that's season 6 man, a window into a deep fascinating world you want to explore that turns out to be painted on the side of a wall. A holographic Yu-Gi-Oh card that was your prized possession until Harry at school told you it was a fake. Shit man, that cuts deep. That's rough buddy. We'll get back to Bran, but first we have to discuss... 
Um, if you have functioning short-term memory, you might recall that I said I may have been too harsh on this episode in the past. Well, yeah, nah, fuck this episode. The King's Moot, or more accurately, the bunch of guys talking, is such an embarrassing scene. First off, I don't know who's to blame for this, and I'm sorry to say it, but the look of the whole thing is just kinda shit. Beyond the muted drab season 6 colouring, every single person is wearing the same mottled grey cloak and there's no sign of any heraldry aside from the Greyjoy Kraken. Previous seasons made an effort to include visual designs that represented people and houses and facets of the world that didn't make it into the dialogue, which goes a long way to making the world feel believable and lived in. There is an unreasonable amount of source material to draw from on the depth of the Iron Islands, and none of it makes it into this scene. None of the other claimants made it either, it's just Yara and Euron who, by the way, make no offerings or anything and just stand around yelling about themselves. What an incredible spectacle. Wow, thanks for doing the King's Moot, you guys. It's canon that any man with a ship may claim to salt throne. And yet none of them do it. Shoot your shot, Gilbert. I believe in you. So, ugh, fine. I guess we'll go through it. Aaron, this is Aaron, by the way. Aaron is like a hey, Lamel who wants to be king. <laughs> and Yara steps forward even though she has boobs. We've never had a queen. See, this guy gets it. Ah, but there are many things that we've never done, like make our mark upon the world, or build one of the world's largest, most famous castles just a few centuries ago, or conquer huge swathes of a continent, or maintain a culture for many thousands of years that everybody knows about and many fear never made your mark upon the world. What the fuck is that? She gets interrupted. When I am queen, we will build a fleet that likes I queen. am not finished. Yes, you are. What? Let her finish. And Theon has to explain that he doesn't want to be king and thinks Yara should be queen. This would have been cool if we didn't already know that this was his stance and also if his being on Pike made any sense, but alas. This is one of those scenes that they've been horrifically twisting all the characters around to reach and man is it not worth it. I like seeing Alfie give a hype speech of course, but it'd be nice if it wasn't ruined in all the ways. To add to the pile of ruination, Euron shows up. No horn, no offering, no anything. Much like a drunk uncle at a family reunion, he stumbles up to interrupt a nice moment and talk about his cock. Big cock. That is a, um... That's a spookily accurate analogy. He makes fun of Theon for losing Winterfell and his little squid maker before admitting in front of all the most powerful people in the Iron Islands that he murdered King Balon Greyjoy. Now, there's this thing in the real world called regicide, where it turns out that people get pretty unhappy with you if you murder a king. But this is a fantasy world where cultural conventions aren't necessarily the same, so unless there's an in-world example of the horrific life-changing difficulties incurred by someone after they're accused of doing a regicide, I can't fault this. But there's also this other thing called kinslaying, where it turns out that- okay, I'll drop the act. The taboo of kinslaying is so strong in this world that Tywin deadass Lannister wouldn't do it. The man who ordered the gang rape of his son's wife. Rickard Karstark cursed Robb Stark as a kinslayer and they're hardly even related really. Tyrion says that he is haunted by the act of kinslaying, and yet Euron flatly admits to this most heinous of sins and literally nobody gives a fuck. Balon was in charge of this place for over 20 years. These men followed him into war twice. They conquered the north under him, they humiliated Tywin Lannister under him, and Euron describes how he murdered him, how nobody liked him, and says, I apologize to you all for not killing him years ago. So what's Theon's response to this? That would have been hard to do. You weren't here. Oh fuck man, the guy just said he murdered your father. And you hit back at him by nitpicking his dialogue worse than I do. The scene just sails right past the kinslaying and makes the person who did it the ruler. That's three times now, this had better not become a trend. Gallivanting. That's the sort of thing you start to say once your dick gets chopped off. Knowing that in my videos I've used words along the lines of verisimilitude and heteropaternal superfecundation, my Kendall Nether region and I take great offence to this. After shitting on Balon for harbouring unrealistically lofty ambitions, Euron announces his plan to conquer the whole universe. He uses the term Big Cock in his manifesto, which I, I, I know what show we're watching and I know what becomes of this character, but come the fuck on. Big cock? Is he drunkenly sexting at four in the morning? You know, I think it's the big I have a problem with more than cock. It's such a 
basic and childish adjective. Maybe I'm unproportionally caught up on dick description, but it's just such uninspired dialogue. Why not mighty or magnificent? Something with character. You already showed us that Euron has a way with words, but then he just goes ahead and pulls out big cock. And it's always stood out to me as super lame. All oh, right, then Aeron, still Aeron, by the way. Aeron crowns Euron while Theon and Yara scurry away with a bunch of ships. The intercut sequence of the drowning and the crowning with the escape isn't that bad. That's cool. Where are my niece and nephew? Let's go murder them. Uh, so not only should nobody be following him after he says this, kinslaying and all, but it's also one of the clunkiest lines ever delivered on this show. Poor Emperor Pilaf. Let's go murder them sounds like something a cartoon villain on a kid's show would say. Like, oh, Emperor Pilaf. It's no bad pussy, but it's up there. Definitely on my top 20. Hit me up, Supercuts. I know you're watching. King Kinslayer tells everyone to go home and build the largest fleet the world has ever seen. Gee, I bet that's gonna take a really long time. Oh, also. When did you return, uncle? A few days ago. Wait, so it's only been a few days since episode two? Wait, wait, wait. So you're telling me that since Balon's death, they found his body, held a funeral, organized the first King's Moot in at least centuries, got all these people here from all the other islands, and now they're holding the King's Moot, and it's only been a few days. And during those few days, Yara was unaware of Euron's return somehow. Also, Theon swam from the north to Pike in this time, because remember, he hasn't stolen Peter's jetpack yet. Daenerys ponders the smoldering remains of the holy site she destroyed, probably thinking about how foolproof her plan to become leader of the Dothraki was, and how glad she is that she never has to rely on plot armor. Just real quick, she does an itty bitty banishment on Joram, but this time it's a nice punishment, Oh, Don't come back until you fix your disgusting illness, you freakish old man! Ian Glenn is great. Emilia Clark also acts. He shows her the grayscale, but says, don't worry, I'ma kill myself before it gets real. But then she commands him to leave her and not come back until he's magically fixed this notoriously unfixable disease. Hey, just an idea, Danny. Do you guys know any incredibly powerful leaders who control thousands and thousands of people from many different cultures that may each have potential remedies for this disease? By any chance? Hello? Any all-powerful autocrats nearby? Maybe behind this rock? Ah, run for your lives! Remember that Shireen's grayscale was cured by the combined efforts of every healer Stannis could find because he was doing everything within his power to keep her safe? Well, Danny seems to have more power than he did and wants nothing more than to keep Jorah alive and she accomplishes this by sending him far, far away from her. This is fucking insane. And it's all out of gratitude for him closing a door while she burnt a building down. <laughs> well, I command you to find the cure. Wherever it is in this world, I command you to heal yourself and then return to me. Yeah, bro, stop wasting my time and cure your grayscale. God! And Dario's there for no reason. The whole time. Just watching in the background. I'll always love you. Then they fuck off in different directions for who knows how long. Maybe when they cross paths once more, they'll be completely different people. Oh, I have been so excited to talk about this scene. You may not understand what this scene means to me. Kinvara is without doubt the most memorable character from this show. And finally, I get to dig into her brilliant introduction and also only scene. The sequence begins with this little prelude where the Marini weenies discuss the aftermath of last episode's mediation. Varys asks Grey Worm about violence due to domestic unrest, and according to Wormless Wormo, things have really calmed down in the two weeks since Tyrion offered the slavers balls to stop funding the harpies. So this is definitely just to lull them into a false sense of security, but you know, why? Why do that? The attack that eventually happens would still catch them with their pants down regardless of this fake piece. So really all this accomplishes is delaying the showdown until Daenerys shows up. My, that's dramatic. It's a little hollow, but I quite like this line from Varys about diplomacy. For now is the best we get in our profession. Before we move on, I'd like to point out that Varys is asking these questions and learning this information just now. Obviously, Grey Worm knows these things because he's in charge of what amounts to the city guard, so that's cool. But then Tyrion pipes up with this nonsense about needing someone to deliver a positive narrative about Daenerys' non-existent involvement in the new piece. And it is nonsense, by the way. Anyway, he already has a solution prepared for this problem he invented out of the answers to the questions Varys was just now asking. So did he have a private discussion 
discussion with Grey Worm earlier? Did they have a meeting without Varys? It just seems wacky that Tyrion has already devised a plan around information that Varys didn't know. The Sons of the Harpy have a good story. Ah, but it's not the best story, is it, Tyrion? So yeah, he decides that they need to push this marketing campaign about Danny bringing the city security, even though she didn't. To do this... We need someone the people trust. Someone they know cannot be bought or influenced. I know! How about a foreign priestess of a minority religion? Everyone knows that clergymen can't be corrupt. Look, I get that they want to tell this story about an outsider failing to navigate the peaceful restructuring of a country, but Tyrion should simply just not be this daft. And also, as we later hear, this actually works. The story the writers want to tell here is completely at odds with the actual plot of Marine. Oh yeah, right, then there's the meeting with the spooky boobly lady herself. Ah, uh, it's shit. It, yeah, yeah, it's shit, isn't it? Kinvara is keen to help them. I will summon my most eloquent priests. And she mysteriously knows details about Tyrion and Varys. But you heard all of this before, haven't you? On the long bridge of Volantis. Take what happened to you, Lord Varys, when you were a child. And then she fucks off. Wow. Yeah, the only thing I like about this is Conlet's performance. Just look at him go. Kinvara mentions the sorcerer who castrated him and all that jazz, which we learned about in season three, which has crazy implications. But foremost, it reminds me that ever since that day, I have hated magic and all those who practice it. So I feel that Varys should be a bit more vocal in resisting Kinvara's involvement in whatever it is Tyrion thinks he's doing. As soon as she mentions The dragons will purify non-believers by the thousands. He should be noping all the way back to Westeros. Oh god, and they don't even reference this when he starts scheming against Daenerys in season 8. There are sitcoms with better consistency and more thorough continuity than this show. Ultimately, this scene teases a story about the perils of making expedient deals with religious fanatics, perhaps to parallel the King's Landing story, but uh, yeah, nah, this doesn't become a story at all and this character never appears again. Like, it could be saying something about religion's role in society, or about how Tyrion isn't so different from Cersei and making the same mistake, but instead of that, we get, uh, nothing. Boo Barella! What the fuck were they thinking? What indeed? Now that he knows that certain important information has been kept from him, I guess, Bran decides to do his own research. He logs onto the Weirwood net without adult supervision and Googles White Walker origin with safe search off. And as a result, all his friends nearly die and he potentially dooms the fate of the entire world. Much as I rip on this show, I must commend it for a bold message about cyber safety. He's gone to the same tree from the vision we saw earlier and I think it's supposed to be in the present? Because the dead arrive as a consequence of this, right? I don't know, it's probably not that important, except maybe it is because time travel? Bran walks through the army of the dead and spots the spooky dude who gives him a wristband so we can get back in without having to pay again. So uh, in previous Caverns of Time scenes, Bran has been effectively incorporeal. Apparently his voice, thoughts, mind can affect the past. Father! But he doesn't have a detectable physical presence. People look straight through him. Except here. Rhaegar perceives and interacts with Bran as though he's genuinely right there in front of him. I would really like to know what's going on here. What, what is it about the dead that allows them to see and touch Bran? Here's the thing. The Mark lets the Night King into the cave, yeah? Which is what he wants because he wants to kill the Three-Eyed Raven because he can access all the stories of humanity or whatever. And there's nothing in the world more powerful than a good story. I think that's the point at least. As we see, pastly and futurely, Bran can't affect the present by going back to the past. Like, Hodor was like this in the present before Bran went back, so this story's time travel is closed loop. Bran isn't rewriting history when he does these things. What he does in the past doesn't change the present. Marty isn't disappearing from the photo. Present Hodor doesn't suddenly change when Bran's skin changes past Hodor. So, if this is in the past, why is it that when Bran gets marked by the guy, things in the present change. The dead can now access the cave, which is time travel altering the present, which is wholly incompatible with the other time travel we've seen so far. Time travel is relevant for like 20 minutes out of the entire show and they still manage to make a mess of it. That is, unless this scene is in the present, it would be nice to have any indication of this, in which case it's still bonkers because like, Bran is still in the cave, right? Why can the Night King interact with Bran? Is it because he inherited weirdwood magic 
sneaky bullshit from Leaf when she made him. We haven't actually seen any children do anything with the Weirwoods or the astral projection time travel shit, so that'd be a wild assumption. Max von Slugma is all like, oh my god, he touched you, bro, that's not supposed to happen, that's really bad, dude. As though he completely understands what's happened and what it means, so why the fuck would he not tell Bran that this could happen? Clearly he knew that the Night King could do this and that it would let them in the cave, which seems pretty fucking important. Yet he chose not to tell Bran this or anything else about the White Walkers aside from the inconsequential detail that the children made them. And it's not about what's fated or meant to happen or anything like that because the time has come for you to become me. Am I ready? Come. So yeah, this scene is um uh, issueistic. The old guy tells them all to fuck off and prepares for the big dramatic last scene he's been building to. He seems all defeated and like he's blaming Bran for this, even though it is without any doubt entirely his fault for withholding information solely for the purpose of pacing the story correctly. Hey look, it's the Arrowhead Mountain again. Gee, I wonder if this place with the tree and the spiral will be at all relevant when a cast of character goes here next season. Whoops! At Castle Black, John has repurposed the rec room into a war room so the gang can talk logistics for their campaign to reconquer the North. And by the gang, I mean John, who is in charge, Tormund, who will be bringing the Free Folk to the fight, Sansa, who is the key to the North and one of Winterfell's heirs, Brienne, who is honor bound to defend Sansa, Davos, who is a military strategist, Melisandre, who. Melisandre's here, and Ed, who is winning against Podrick at Tiddlywinks before John interrupted the game. Jono quickly establishes why they need to take Winterfell, which is basically the same reason Stannis has in the books, and it makes sense. If we want to survive, we need Winterfell, and to take Winterfell, we need more men. We're told again that the support of houses Umber, Karstark, and Manderley is important, but Smoljan Umber and Humbert Karstark have already declared for Ramsay. Instead of the conversation then turning to the loyalty of Wyman Manderley, who potentially holds the fate of the North in his hands, Sansa chooses to elaborate on the culpability of the people who are already allied with Ramsay. It'd be fine if she just put a pin in this for now when we came back to Manderley later, but we don't. Logically, the focus of this scene should be about securing Wyman Manderley's forces, yet after this brief name drop establishing his house's importance, he isn't mentioned once. If only there was source material you could adapt where one of these characters fucking goes to White Harbor. They decide to petition a shit ton of smaller houses instead of the one very powerful house who historically has been staunchly loyal to the Starks. I mean, they send Brienne to Riverrun to ask Brynden for the six dudes he has even though a single moment of thought would lead you to the conclusion that he's probably already fucking busy with them. That's good. The Blackfish is a legend. His support would mean a great deal. This is true, but it's also true of Wyman Manderley. But we've got to get Brienne to River Run so she can have a scene with Jamie. Everyone in this room is pretending that they want to retake Winterfell, but really they all know that their true goal is to get Jamie and Brienne in the same room again before the end of season six. That's what's really important to Dolorous Ed, who doesn't say anything in the scene, and Melisandre, who is going with Jon for some reason, even though she hasn't seemed at all interested in him since Davos told her to go away two episodes ago. John is every bit as much Ned Stark's son as Ramsay is Roose Bolton's. Is this a hint that Ramsay actually isn't Roose's son? Sansa refers to the Blackfish as her uncle three times in this scene. My uncle the Blackfish. And my uncle has an army. Ride for River Run. My uncle will talk to you and you'll know how to talk to him. Which is weird given that Peter correctly said he was her great uncle back in Molestown. Your great uncle, Brendan. It peeves me that she lies about knowing how Brynden retook Riverrun. This is a meeting about acquiring enough men to fight Ramsay and she decides to not mention the army that Peter offered her. Why not a scene where she tells Jon in private and he's super keen on the Knights of the Vale but she explains to him why they can't accept Peter's offer? Making the conflict external instead of internal would be both more entertaining and more logical. The way it is now I can only see working if they turn it into a story about how communication is important in a family. More on this as we go on, of course. Ramsay could intercept a raven, so Brienne has to go to River Run herself instead. Yeah, everyone knows it's impossible to intercept a person on a horse. John seems trustworthy. A bit brooding, perhaps. I suppose it's understandable considering. Ah! 
Finally, Brienne calls out Davos and Melisandre's insane jump in loyalty. And when Stannis paid for his crime, where were they? Already out looking for a leader with better prospects. Oh boy, I can't wait to see that issue explored. Sansa made Jon a new cloak on. Then they all fuck off and there's a funny funny where Ed realises he's in charge now. Yeah. <clears throat> Close the bloody gate. Now I get to talk about this plot for the third time this video. Fucking hooray. Mira is talking breakfast foods with Hodor, which is cute, and then she notices her breath being all cold, which is out of the ordinary. Hmm, strange. Usually my breath doesn't do that up here in the fucking Arctic Circle. She goes outside to confirm her fears, only to find all the children already out here having not screamed or raised alarm or anything, which is cool. I like the intercutting between the frantically paced escape from the cave and the peaceful farewell at Winterfell. That That's cool. But consider that Maxi could have taken Bran to any setting where Hodor was, so why here? Does Bran need to know something in particular about Ned leaving for the Vale? It's just strange is all. How did the children lose the war against men if they had motherfucking plasma grenades? They needed to create the White Walkers as their ultimate weapon? Really? Wait, hang on. Also, the Night King does this thing where he like ice bends the ground to threaten collapsing the cave entrance? We never see this again, but I guess that's just because there are never any other situations where controlling ice would be advantageous for him. <coughs> Mira picks up a sword and no, it's not Dark Sister. So Rhaegar's mark lets the dead come into the cave because it breaks the ancient magic that protects the three-eyed raven from them. Uh, maybe. In season eight, they tell us that it's like a homing beacon for the Night King, so does it have nothing to do with magical seals and they just didn't know where they were? If so, that's incongruous with season four's showdown at the cave where the whites literally disintegrate integrate when they cross the threshold. Is it both? It can be both, but then why doesn't the mark also dispel the magic on the wall that keeps the walkers from going south? This plot element is just a mess. Anyone notice that the visions Bran has have nothing to do with weirwoods? Like, there's no weirwood in the Winterfell courtyard or at the Tower of Joy. Summer saves Mira's life, who realizes that if this were a possibility, they probably should have set up a fucking failsafe, because literally the only reason that Hodor's entire life was ruined is that Bran was in a vision when he needed to escape. If only she knew sooner that the trick was to yell really loud at him. Come to think of it, the whole thing is recursive. It only needs to happen because because it needs to happen. If Bran hadn't done this, then he wouldn't needed to have done it. Summer is a good boy, and they did him dirty. Oh god, I forgot to mention that Bran just randomly names the Night King earlier. He saw me! The Night King! He saw me! And nobody's like, what the fuck are you talking about? Even though this is the first time anyone's ever put those words next to each other like that. Come. Okay. How the fuck is Bran still in the vision? It's been very consistent that every time he lets go of the roots, he leaves the vision. The link between the roots and the vision was explicitly shown to us like half an hour ago, but now he just stays in there even though he's let go of the fucking root. Raven Daddy's death looks pretty schmick, I'll give him that. And Hodor gets slowly and brutally torn apart by zombies, intercut with young Willis losing his mind. And to think all of this could have been avoided if only Leaf had installed a deadbolt. Now is when I make a joke about how Glidus is a Hodor style truncation of Glide the Bus or something fucking dumb like that. So did Ned just never tell the kids that Hodor was a regular kid or what? Same with Roderick, Benjen and Old Nan. These people knew Hodor for years and the Stark kids grew up around both them and Hodor. So how was this a secret? He was a normal kid aside from the dunk genes and then one day he had an extremely public freaky seizure and he was completely different from then on and nobody ever mentioned it again. Oh man. We do love Hodor. So yes, his death and the simultaneous revelation Revelation that most of his life was one big mindfuck to save Bran is tragic. It is a well-produced and emotionally provocative sequence. It is also the result of, and entirely dependent on, a series of tiring contrivances which I hope I've illustrated. It also is in service of setting up a plot element that, for all intents and purposes, may as well not exist from this scene onwards. I've been saying that season 6 frequently makes promises that are swiftly abandoned. If I were to make my own video about abandoned plotlines, it would mostly just be a summary of this season. This episode might be the peak of this bothersome trend. The bloody hand is good, I care about Hodor, and there's no nauseating King's Landing plot meandering about, but other than that, I stand by my judgement of the doer. And if you like it, cool, whatever. Just a quick reminder though that your opinion only counts if you're subscribed.
I'm going to say all the patrons at once this time because the video is already long enough. <laughs> and also Andy. Andy's separate for some reason. Thanks much. I have been requested to say Throw another shrimp on the barbie. So there you go, happy birthday. Though I must say that I've lived on the jail continent all my life and not only do we almost always call them prawns, I don't think I've ever seen them cooked on a barbie either. There's much to be said about the terms shrimp and prawn because they're both colloquial and lack any consistent scientific meaning. Stay tuned for taxonomy review while got review takes another three year hiatus. People who don't like dogs should be killed. Now that he knows that certain important and I'm gonna take the drugs